think uh, Cheryl has been teaching this course for seven times. Seven times. And I've uh, had the opportunity to begin to observe a little bit again this uh, no, semester. Five times. Five times. Five times. And Seems like so. And Seems like I would say this, she's come a long way from that first time in terms of the way in which she's addressed these issues and how she's teaching students to become more actively, intellectually uh, engaged in these topics by the blended teaching that you've been working on. I don't know if that's going to come up. But I think that film is a fantastic way for us to understand this tremendous narrative. And so we've had a the great opportunity to have Cheryl, who um, has been teaching here for 25 years, and uh, really got a lot of traction in Paris when she was studying there, uh, and uh, uses critical theory and other theories to look at new ways of understanding uh, this art uh, form. So, Cheryl, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Well, thanks for <laughs> thanks so much for inviting me. Um, we could go to the first slide, but I'm not going to actually. I just want to preface it by saying that the cultural piece of this whole project has always been an outlier, and um, there are a lot of engineers and scientists and social workers and psychologists and all the other people involved, and architects and so on involved in this. And the cultural piece, you know, for, for, for a lot of reasons, having to do with our common sense thinking, I think, about what culture is, often gets pushed to the margin. Seems like, you know, what we do when we're done working, we go home, we turn the TV on, or we go to a movie with our friends. And so I come from a tradition sort of coming out of the late 60s and beyond, certainly with the growth of mass culture, where there's a, 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 a powerful and important theoretical understanding of the influence of culture, by which we really mean mass culture, largely. Um, but the way culture shapes our opinions, our laws, our policies, our practices, our desires, and on and on. And so what is the process by which that all happens, and how does it influence people sitting on the Supreme Court or in the Oval Office, or in classrooms, or deciding how to build a nursing home, or work in one, or thinking about our bodies and how we age. And so that's kind of the broader uh, framework that I work from. And um, so a aging was a definitely a new thing to think about, and it's conditioned by environmental pressures, you know, which I'll, I'll be speaking about. But sort of the general thing, I guess the general frame, my general framework is that our ideas and practices about aging are constructed or produced in a particular context. And so, the, and that context um, is often thought, and again, this is kind of a late 19th century tradition in terms of ideology, political economy, so a, a specific sense of what condition, what determines us in the environment. So that's just an overall, and I hope that you know the hour and, or, and plus that we're going to spend together that you get something out of it. Um, so these are the seven courses that I've taught on aging since this grand project began, and I, and I really do have um, Dennis to blame for a lot of it, and Lee and and uh, John Shreve, Lee Foster and John Shreve too, for. Um, for enticing me to think about these things in the context of, of work already underway. And the first grand event was the interdisciplinary graduate colloquium that we called New Cities that took place in this room before it was um, torn apart and refashioned and to look like what it looks. And it brought together graduate students and, and some few extraordinary undergraduates, including my own daughter, um, from architecture and American studies and communications. communications and gerontology. I think that's got it. And it was a grand experiment that, you know, we're angel, only angels, we're fools tread where only angels should have treaded. But uh, I was a fly on the wall for that. That was my first experience. And, and we really focused on these questions of especially housing. 
you know, and all these issues of um, this, as Lee Foster was the first to put this word in my mouth for population aging, the tsunami of 80 million, you know, the changing demographic in the U.S. from one in 12 people being over 65 to one in four people being over 65. And I don't know about you, but ever since I began this project, I've already started to see the difference in Lawrence, where I've lived for over 25 years. And this is on its way to becoming a retirement community. I already, not just because I myself am aging, but I'm very, very much more aware of it. And that was the focus of that. And then inspired by that, I did have the opportunity to teach an uh, unbelievable uh, group of English honor students, since I'm 50% appointed, again, being a fool. I have, uh, I'm 50% appointed in American Studies and English. So there, I taught an English honors pro seminar, so of very ambitious and smart juniors, again in this room, a course that was entitled Literature and the Life Course. It was an extremely generative experience, a great experience for me and for that small group of students, and many uh, extraordinary projects came out of it because these students are up and comers. And um, so, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about that today, but that was great. And then it was really Dennis's brainchild to uh, have this course staging in film. And he was gonna do it anyway. And I said, well, let's do that together. And, um, and we had a, a wonderful experience and it's become a really important site for me to teach the kind of things that I think are important to students, A, and B, to have these conversations about the future with young people. And so that's been, in my 25 plus years teaching here, one of the most um, satisfying experiences I've had. Um, so as I told you, I, so I'm in American Studies in English, and again, around the 80s, a field developed that's come to be known very, very around the world as cultural studies. And it's informed by theories that developed first within Marxism about ideology, and it's pretty much informs most work in the humanities and social sciences at this point. Maybe not strictly speaking, maybe people don't actually know all the details, but if you translate it into something like social construction, there's a piece of it that's been hugely influential. So I see aging as, um, as um, produced by these cultural processes that we have ways of thinking about and that are very broad, and is something that, I mentioned mass culture before, but that's just a piece of it, is something that transforms our individual experience, our everyday life, our social relationships, and um, that is, is uh, related to power as well. So the goals of cultural studies are not only to look at the practices involved in this cultural processes, and they include material, economic, political, and geographical, and historical context, but also to um, advocate for more equality, more equity, uh, improvement in, 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 in constantly against contemporary pressures. And so some of the contemporary pressures that are most often emphasized would be consumer culture, uh, globalization in, in a particular meaning, in some of its meanings, and um, um, finance capitalism or neoliberalism. So those are some of the words that people um, will use when they talk about the context in which our culture engages with values, beliefs, and ideas. I hope that's a good enough introduction, but hopefully what we'll talk about will give some concrete demonstrations of what I mean. And some of this language comes from what I think is a pretty straightforward and good website that North Carolina has, and I just, I just borrowed their stuff so that I could give you a link to, for, to a small group of further readings for anyone who should be interested, but to a fairly good kind of branding uh, in simple language. So um, the way I teach film, and I, and I think, you know, I'm sure everyone's busy. I know I am. I don't go to one quarter of the things I'm actually genuinely interested in because we're all very busy. But I do think that there are some people who might have come to a Boomer Futures think tank who thought, I don't really care about film. I mean, that's pretty much soft culture. What does it matter to what I do and think about? And so what I try to teach my students is why it matters and why it's not just what we do when, you know, when we stop doing important things. On the contrary, it's when very important things are happening. And so I teach, sorry, go back. I teach film as an element 
of, of the culture that transforms, reproduces aging. Um, actually, that's okay. That next one was okay. Um, um, in, in terms of those elements that I've already emphasized, which is our individual experience, and that includes our desires, our, our relationships with others, um, and the power that, that is exercised on us or that we exercise on others. And, um, and so this is significant because we are all parts of societies and groups adapting to unique pressures and changes. And so we're trying to situate our resources, you could say most specifically, in relation to those changes. Who are they going to advantage? Who are they going to disadvantage? And culture participates in the process of deciding what's most important. You know, and it's not a top-down process. That's what's so complicated about it. It's, it's actually a circuit of interacting processes. And that's important because that means we can always make a difference. We have agency in it. It's not just this huge propaganda machine. That's not the way we think about how it works, which is the way the first people to really think about mass culture after World War II, the, who were members of the Frankfurt School, they actually did see it that way. Sometimes when we feel very discouraged, we say they were right. We don't really have any power over, over the, the dissemination of information that's shaping our opinions. But that's a bad day. On a good day, we say, yes, we do. We can make a difference. <laughs> So um, I wanted to just get some images out there for us to have in our minds as we move forward. And I chose two examples. And the first one is the trailer of a documentary called Young at Heart. How many of you have seen this stuff, right? One, two, a couple. So it's actually about a, a, a choral group. Lots of others have kind of actually formed off of the idea. Today we will be discussing social satisfaction. Some they're women work, 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 and they don't get enough social stimulation. Some women are not able to have enough social encounters because of the children. Oh, oh another one is on the Thank you. So, um... They're based in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is, a, as from what I've learned, a pretty cool place. I've never been there. And the choral group was organized and is run by someone who's about my age, who's a boomer. Do not do this. He had, it would be interesting really to figure out how it all happened, but he had the bright idea of creating a repertoire for older adults based on music from his generation. I think it's very significant, and it's a, a British... Uh, maybe we'll see this trailer, maybe we won't. Let's see. I just I gotta find where it's... Hiding. Skip ad. There we go. Perfect. The beginning's rather...
produced, that, that things in reality do not exist in a simply true manner, um, but are a his constructed at a historical moment. Um, this is just, uh, th this kind of intervenes with the way students think about documentaries as such. So what I think is so great, there's so many great things about Young and Heart, but you so, there, and, and there's some things I hope you'll reflect back on as I go on and tell you kind of the analytic lenses that I bring. Um, and um, in the study of this and other films, but I think it's fantastic because it challenges age stereotypes about the ability. Thank goodness it's Brenna. Thank you so much for doing that. It would be a lot worse if I were driving. So um, it it challenges age stereotypes about the ability of older adults cognitively, physically, and so on. This is super important. And secondly, I think it's a really fabulous and fun film because, you know, this in inventive idea of Bob Silmans to use this boomer repertoire with older adults actually creates shared meaning and connections across generations and produces new meanings of the music themselves and in the experience of the older adults, suddenly uttering words that were produced by people of a different age with completely different meanings and also that are familiar to a different segment of the audience. And so the audience relates to the performers differently because they're speaking their language and uh, th this, uh, this has really very, very interesting effects. And I think that's part of the experience of teaching aging that for me has been so formidable is discovering how wide the divides of age really are, how much younger people what they imagine about our lives and what we think and so on, and certainly vice versa. And so another thing about watching this and other films like it is that you realize how significantly different spectatorship is, and I'll be speaking specifically about that later, so that what I understand when I watch this film and what they understand, what I connect with and what they connect with is so vastly different. And over several iterations of teaching it, I've I've had to go to YouTube, thank goodness for YouTube, and look at the songs that this choral group is covering, and, and that has opened up worlds, because they're not all boomer groups, right? Coldplay is not a boomer group. And so <laughs> students will know uh, songs and that I've never even heard of, and then I'll watch them on YouTube, and then that gives occasion to talk about lots of other things about the ways we are shaped by a, cult, the culture, a cultural environment, cultural materials at a certain moment, the way our environment is segmented and different for different people. And so we have great, lots of great moments like that in the classroom, and I think Young and Heart is a really good example. Okay, this next one is going to be a little bit harder. It's just a teeny piece of a TV show, so I've expanded the course a little bit to include some television because who knows what we even call this stuff anymore. It's visual media. media. I mean, it's not even TV anymore, right? So. So this is uh, an example of a quote-unquote TV program. Where is it? Yeah. It is um, slide eight. There it is. Right there. So um, this is a T. Both <laughs> both of the nursing home programs that I showed are actually based on British programs that were imported to the U.S. and and somewhat adapted, but same scripts and so on. And so. This program takes a little translation, but it's called Derek. The main character, some of my students had heard of, I had never heard of. His name is Ricky Gervais. So constantly, we're like, they know who I don't know, and I know who they don't know. Could you hold it for a second? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can fix that or not. So to try to set it up, Derek is so somehow like a slightly challenged individual and um, he's working in the nursing home. And, and this is difficult because I'm just giving you one segment, but, but, uh, but I think it will do to, um, and, and I can talk about some of the work that we're doing in, with films in general by just watching this. Just a bit knackered, leave it with me. I'll come back to you. It's just shit. That's all they do in these rooms, filling with shit. In too much space. Just honestly, just get some skips in, clear the fucking lot out. <laughs> This is, this is his office, isn't it? This is where he's in office. <gasps> you haven't fixed it. You haven't thrown it away. Seriously? She's asked me to fix it. 
graphics that sorted it, problem sorted in the bin. It's not, it's not worth it. You see, the thing, I don't mind fixing things that are important. She doesn't remember. Yeah, thanks for coming. Lovely to see you. All right. Just, uh, oh. just go inside. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. See you later. See ya. It's not sad. He comes to see you all the time. It's not me. He comes to see. <laughs> Do you think, would there be, ever, ever be a lady or man upstairs what could be as old as the tortoise, as the oldest animal? Yeah, they're getting close to up there now, Derek. Average age is about 85 up there. Some of them up there are knackered. I don't know at what point you can say a life is ended, because some of them don't move. You know, the knees are gone, the backs have gone, their eyes have gone, their ears have gone. Jack, with his ear and aid, battery on the side of his head. The battery runs out, I don't see the point of putting a new battery in there. But what would you do if you was if you was Jack and someone said, oh, it's not worth it, what would you do? say, well, no, I need your battery, please? What would you do if you was if you was old, like a tortoise, and someone said, oh, don't bother with him, he's 100? I'd save you. I don't, I don't care how old you was. Bathroom. <coughs> That's where the sheets are and everything. kind of difficult to understand the accent on that one. You really need such the captions. But um, this one focuses on a nursing home where the practices, the space itself, and the workers are unconventional. And so we see we're, there's, a, there's a kind of a, uh, a, an arg argument or an advocacy going on for a different kind of space. We contrast this with a program that just started showing this year, again, based on a British program called Getting On. Anybody seen that? That's very dystopic view of, a, of it's a, 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 a ward in a hospital, but um, the kinds of things that would happen that would never happen in getting on. And so by showing us something different, it's, 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 enter, it's, it's participating in debates about care for older adults and the resources that should be allocated for it, when we should quit, how far we should go, and um, and it also uses variations in ability by having, for example, Derek, this principal character, being a little odd, um, and several of the other staff members as well being kind of outcast and odd, of showing variations in ability across the life course that make the problems that we associate with aging problems that can uh, affect <coughs> our lives all across the life course, and do, not can, but do. And so it's another um, example of how uh, I think films are working to po are, are participating in debates that we're all having it around the dinner table or or um, in various other places in policy rooms in board meetings and so on so uh, where I want to go from here is is back to a little bit of theory not a lot but a little bit so what did I mean when I said there's this circuit and when I keep saying when I keep saying to my students is not just what you're watching in movies. This is happening in an exchange with what you think when you make a decision, when you're faced with hard decisions, when you have a voice at the table making hard decisions, when you're deciding how to split a pool of money, when you're voting. And so um, this is probably the original diagram. I'm going to show you about four different diagrams. So if you can't read it, don't get too upset about it. Let me tell you the principal things. This diagram was created by a guy named Richard Johnson. Um, you can look all of these up on the web. Um, and, and you can look more closely in the attributions. It's from a book called What is Cultural Studies Anyway? It was produced by one of the co-founders of the Birmingham School where cultural studies first developed. And it was published in this book that appeared in 1983. It's a very early diagram that's trying to show how this interactive process works and that's trying to um, interrupt ideas that are based in 18th, late 18th and early 19th century thought, in aesthetic thought, about the object determining meaning, right? So we don't see it that way for folks and our desires and so on. And so up there is, um, at one pole is the word text. At the um, on the left hand pole is the word production, on the right hand pole is the word consumption, and at the bottom are the words lived experience and social relations. So those are the four principal areas, and those words production and consumption may be familiar to you if you're familiar with Marxist ideological analysis, which which look at 
um, uh, at, at those um, as categor categories of importance when trying to understand any cultural object or practice. So, uh, so that was the first diagram, but it evolved a little bit. Let's see the second one. This one um, is the most widely circulated now, and it, 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 sh it uses all those arrows in a circle to show that this is a dynamic process. And um, this appears in a book which I actually brought. I can show it to you if you're interested. That appeared in the 90s. Stuart Paul, Peter Duguay, and a couple of other people whose names I forget. And it's called, um, I think, something like Cultural Studies, The Sony Walkman. And the case is, the remember, The Walkman? <laughs> so um, it was all about this new technology and the way it was disseminating music. I mean, these transformations that we're st are still making our heads spin to figure out how they're all changing and affecting our life and the way we consume culture and the way it consumes us. Um, so that's when this diagram appeared in this and other books that were starting to appear as textbooks in the 90s, only 10 years later. And so this, um, in this slide, there have been a few kind of, you could say, elaborations or substitutions. And so uh, readings, uh, texts become representation, which you can probably see better in this slide. And production stays the same. And uh, readings, which appeared, I didn't mention in the first slide, becomes consumption. There's all kinds of material, cultural material that we consume without reading it. So we got away from that sort of literary model. Um, and lived culture and social relations, which was at the bottom of that last uh, uh, slide. Not that it matters that it was at the bottom, right? Because it's all circulating. But here it becomes uh, identity and regulation, a really interesting word, about the way social relationships and laws and various social institutions uh, shape, regulate, limit our desires and beliefs and so on. Um, so the next one um, is interesting because it takes those, that same diagram and it adds another interesting insight, which is the reason I'm showing it. I can't quite track down the source, but it's associated with Stuart Hall. And the interesting thing about it is that it organizes the five moments in that other chart um, so that the things that are visible or visual or that we can access visually are separated from the things that participate in this process without our ever being able to see them. Right, like ideology in general, as you can imagine, is like an invisible force that shapes us. So, so the films that I'm talking about would sort of fall in the category of signification or representation or our bodies, identity, things that we can see that shape our ideas, that, that construct our ideas about aging. On the other hand, these categories of regulation, consumption, and production are not easy to see. You have to really inquire and do research to, to understand how they're participating in this process, but they're always really important factors in the environment. Before I came here today, I observed a class, and it reminded me of things I might have shown you from the Sony Walkman book. Um, but I observed a class in which the American Studies graduate teaching assistant was showing students um, how the idea of American exceptionalism um, could be seen in early newspaper articles and images. And so there was an image from uh, 1830 that accompanied a speech by then President Jackson about Indian removal. And the image was actually that they selected, the GTAs are phenomenal, was a, 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 an ad for ivory soap. Okay, so you've got this Andrew Jackson type caricature handing this huge bar of white, yes, ivory soap, to the, these representations of Native Americans that you know would make your skin curl or, or to skin curl. It would be upsetting to see these images now. And so, um, but but this is exactly the point: is that um, this way of communicating and me meanings about cleanliness and soap and selling us on the significance of soap was embedded in a particular context where particular things were happening and particular ideas were circulating and being debated. And so that's the case now. It's harder for us to see always in the present moment how these things work. Um, 
That's enough about that. So we're about to kind of make a turn and see some more visual images and um, some different examples and also the way that I bundle the, the various meanings about aging of which there are, you know, an infinite number, the way I organize them for analysis in the class that I've been developing. And so um, these are the three areas. And actually, as I was presenting them now, I can see better, better how to align them with the categories on that circuit of culture than I have really thought in the past. But they're basically the physical body, number one, Number two, social relationships. And number three, the economy, <laughs> right? And this is the most surprising, right? And, 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 and perhaps innovative, but that we're not aging, let's just say, um, you know, in the 1930s when Social Security was first developed or in the 1960s when Medicaid and Medicare were first developed, we're aging at a time when resources are actually being withdrawn from what we might call the public good. And this affects our thinking about aging and our experience about, about aging and our relationships and our opportunities in a profound way. And so those are the three things we look for and that we find in the films that we watch. The physical body, the yeah, the physical body, social relationships, like, so culture is being produced in our relationships. That's the everyday life, social relations. We're manufacturing consent <coughs> all the time in our relationships in these ways that are largely unreflected. And when you start thinking about it, you know, after five times of teaching this course, if I say, you know, my face looks really old today, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to think that way. You know, and so you can begin to resist, you know, very dominant meanings that are circulating in our culture through critical reflection. And you start to ask yourself, do I really believe this? Do I want to resist this? What is it going to take to resist it because I'm going against a tidal wave? Because these meanings are circulating everywhere. When I look in the mirror, when I talk to my daughter, when I talk to my older sister, you know, when I think about what I'm going to do when I retire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the third thing is the economy, capital, labor, working conditions, uh, questions of how you're going to support yourself, how you're going to allocate, bequ bequeath your resources, all those kind of questions are circulating. So in what follows, I'm going to name films and I'm going to offer visual images, just samples from films that were especially relevant as sources of signification in these three interrelated areas of meaning. And so this is a point where I'm going to have some lists just for the sake of, of showing you how the vast numbers of films I've worked with fit into these categories. So this would be a good point if you feel like you want to add something or you're reflecting back on Young at Heart or Derek to feel free to raise your hand and jump in before I'm quite finished. So um, this is pretty much just the second half is that we're going to look at examples, okay? So, oops, one back. Oh, sorry. So each uh, set of images is going to be preceded by a little bit of elaboration about those three categories that I mentioned. And so the first one, and examples of the bunches, and remember these are interrelated categories. They're only separate for the sake of analysis. Right, when we're talking about what happens to the physical body, you know, we're also going to be talking about social relationships, and we're also going to be talking about the economy and work and labor. A laborer, uh, one of my students uh, did a fantastic job making a presentation about um, a documentary about inequalities in health and showing how the body ages differently, obviously, if you're rich or poor, or if you, if you do physical labor for your life, or you don't, and so on. So, um, so cultural process, as I, as I note here, often focuses on the physical body and the individual, including the brain, including cognition, and here I'm just making that parenthesis. Remember, we're connecting this to social context and other things, too. Many films circulate meanings about aging as physical decline. They're going to be multiplying. These films, you can imagine the intensification of cultural production around the meanings of aging is going to be skyrocketing like everything else in the next 20 or 30 years. So, you know, it's not by accident that ever since I taught this course, there's 
double or triple the amount of, pop, of pop, widely distributed aging films than there were the year before. And I'm sure you've seen many of them. And I have to say that my sample of films, don't think I don't know about those films, but I've restricted the films I use in my class to films that, and this is very old fashioned, it's gonna change soon, but that students can stream legally. <laughs> and that I can stream legally. And so that has meant a lot of adaptation because, because the library of, of the commercial, huge commercial operation that is Netflix changes from month to month which I didn't know the first time I selected all my streaming films and then my whole syllabus was devastated because they were all, all taken away. But here are some films, don't change it yet, that yeah. circulate <coughs> meanings about aging specifically as physical decline. And they would include, of the ones I've taught, Cocoon, which students uh, exposed me to. I'd never seen that when it came out. It's fantastic. On Golden Pond. And note the years. I'm going to say something about the years, too. Young at Heart, which you just saw a piece of, that tongue and open mouth and bad teeth at the opening of the film. Uh, Andrew Jenks' Room 335, which is not easy, it widely distributed, so unfortunately I haven't been able to teach that one as much as I would like. That one focuses the camera on the actual death of one of the nursing home residents. Very difficult scene uh, to watch. How to Live Forever, an interesting documentary made by uh, the son of Haskell Wexler, a very <coughs> famous documentary filmmaker who, after the death of one or both of his parents, got inspired to think about mortality and went around the world interviewing people about the limitations of the human body, the possibilities of extending life more than we've already done in the last hundred years. Um, and Joan Rivers, A Piece of Work, which is a really interesting documentary. And there's a person who's a great example because of her, she's kind of like a follow-up to How to Live Forever. She's done, you know, obviously so much uh, cosmetic surgery to her body, feeling that it's very important to retain a youthful appearance. And indeed, she's right. Meanings about aging circulate, especially in relation to aging celebrities, not just those who try to keep up a youthful uh, appearance, but those whose aging appearance we're all acutely conscious of because we have a, a public archive of them at various ages. And so this experience that is also very age specific or cohort specific. So we have this experience. If you watch what apparently is a f super famous TV program like NCIS, I only learned about this recently, but it turns out that the coroner in that is David McCollum, the formerly handsome, adventurous spy in Man from Uncle. And so we have this experience all the time when we see, you know, an older Julie Christie or an older David McCollum, or an older Sally Field, and these people are gonna get a lot more work right now because of this explosion of interest in, in debate about, cultural debate about the question of aging. So here are just some examples. So this actually isn't from the movie. I don't think she let herself look quite this bad in the movie, but these are just stills that I was able to easily um, harvest from the internet. And uh, this is a movie we didn't watch together as a class. I saw it this year. Many of my students saw it in Nebraska. The, I wanted to show you the poster, which is black and white, and it really focuses on Dern's wisps of hair up there. So super important focus on his decline, cognitive decline, and on his physical decline. And so these actors, one of the things we also talk about in my class is, is, is people acting old. So there's a difference you know, that you'll see if you'll go to stage performances or if you'll see an actor like Bruce Dern outside of the performance and what it takes to sort of adopt the postures and limitations that you attribute as a universal characteristic to an older adult. So we can see how certain beliefs and expectations are being shaped and formed. It's a great movie, I thought. Oscar Berliner, it's a terrific movie documentary called Nobody's Business. It's the younger filmmaker, Alan Berliner, likes to make family movies, and I would highly recommend him to you. But this particular movie is an interview with his then um, late 80s year old father. I think his father was just a few years before his death. It was a very antagonistic interview. It was fantastic. And, um, and again, you know, a shot like that really reminds us, and this happens in another re more recent uh, film by Berliner that's about an uncle who had Alzheimer's. Some of you may have seen this more recent film of his. Um, 
this focus on the body. So that's one of the three main <coughs> kind of categories of meaning that we use to analyze the various films that we watch. So here's the second one, social relations. Now remember that in that circuit, in that diagram, social relations fell underneath, they fall out of sight, they're not visible. But what we're looking at is representations of social relations. But what I always tell my students is that, okay, we're looking at a representation that creeps its way into our actual social relationships or at representations that are informed by somebody's actual relationships because these things actually are not being produced by machines, right? Representations, the screenwriters, and the tons of people involved in writing and producing this material are humans just like us who have relationships that they're drawing on, that they're thinking about, and that they're, in a sense, you could say, you know, you could say they're disseminating, or you could say they're discussing, or you could say they're making fun of, they're all challenging, all these different things are actually happening. So, when I thought about this slide, I mean, I, I, so I put public representation in private life just to remind you of this interaction that's going on between representation, signification, our personal identities, the way we live ourselves, our lives, and our bodies, and in our relationships, in these other um, elements of the cultural process. But I also thought I really blew it because I didn't put care up there. Caring, caregiving belongs right here. Okay, this is an element that, that all these representations of social relations are questioning, right? How are we gonna care for ourselves, for one another? Who's gonna do it? Who's gonna pay for it? This is on everybody's mind. Can I shoot myself first? You know, all that we know the questions. And so um, I just mentioned some of the themes in that appear in films that capture the issue of caregiving, I would say, and they include someone who's very lonely and inactive. They include intergeneral relationships, especially around caregiving. They include the issue of generativity. What is an older person? What is their value? What are they giving? What are they passing down? What are they teaching um, materially or culturally? And they also include uh, some material about reflecting on your own life, assessing your own life. There's well, lots of that is appearing in film as well. And some of the films, before you go, some of the films I've listed that we use that treat these themes are a film like a commercial narrative films like Cloudburst and Mid August Lunch. I'm going to be showing um, an image from Mid August Lunch. Um, Loneliness and Inactivity, that documentary Nobody's Business that Alan Berliner made about his father. This is a man who's very isolated in a fabulous New York apartment. Um, I'm Not Rappaport. Um, you may remember that it was initially a play. Uh, two older gentlemen who are really struggling to maintain a social life. Um, in an in, in, um, swallowing word. And How About You and Reach For Me are two of these kind of nursing home films. Both um, are kind of hard for students, a little quirky. Um, the intergeneral relationships are foregrounded in nobody's business in the film um, uh, Cloudburst in a very interesting way. It kind of plays on Thelma and Louise, but the Brad Pitt guy is not a bad guy. And um, Derek and Getting On, those two uh, nursing home television shows, we saw Derek. Generativity appears in the film Young at Heart. I mean, we see these older adults have plenty to give, and people are receiving it. Um, and similarly, Joan Rivers, she calls herself an industry. She's interested in, she's a multimillionaire. She's supporting a lot of people, including her own lifestyle. And um, Jero Dreams of Sushi, a film about a remarkable 90-year-old uh, sushi chef who um, has a lot of apprentices. I also have a still from that. And then finally, that assessment, reflection, storytelling, legacy, a lot, you're going to see a lot of plays and movies. I've been going to New York lately and seeing aging plays. A lot of them are about memoirs, reflection, assessment. And so in visual representations, these these work a little bit differently than when you read a memoir, but those memoirs are proliferating too. And so um, let's, and 56 Up, I can't forget 56 Up, the latest in the series of the longitudinal visual documentary study by uh, Michael Apted of, I 
think it's around 14 individuals starting from the age of seven every seven years. And this is very interesting, very, very interesting, and it especially involves this kind of assessment, asking people to, where are you in your life, what matters, what's happened, and so on. And giving a close-up of their wrinkly face, right? We're actually seeing the way in which they're providing necessary social support to one another at the end of their life, having a good time, living life like everyone else does. This mid-August lunch I just love. It's an Italian movie, so there's a lot of wine drinking and a lot of food and a lot of, um, the, this is the son and the mother, and the mother is a very wealthy, but now shabby genteel, rich lady, and the son like is out of work and divorced and alcoholic, basically. And so by this accident on this holiday, he winds up um, in a position where these ladies never want to go home to their isolated families. And there's a question, though, in this film that's unique and important, which is who, who's paying for it? There's a lot of emphasis on the exchange of money, who has money and who doesn't, who does the work. So he's like, you know, imagine he's serving now seven different women. He's used to living with his mother, but now he's got all these other people who got dropped off so their families could go do something else, and in the end, they don't want to go home. But this question about who's going to pay for it and who's going to do the work, very, very important question on everybody's mind today. Talk a lot to my students about the unpaid labor of caregiving today. So this is from the Jero Dreams of Sushi movie, and this is a really good representation of what the movie has to show about the significance of mastery and apprenticeship. So here's not a guy who he's not isolated, He's not feeble. His facial aging doesn't matter. He, uh, it, it presents age rather as an achievement in terms of his ability and remarkable knowledge. And it's also interesting in terms of economy, which we're going to go to next, because this is not a movie that just focuses, again, on, on, on his actions, but it situates them in the whole economy of fish. So we go to the fish market, we go to the ships, we talk about how the tuna has been fished out, all different kinds of dimensions of the culture that he belongs to come into play. But also very important is this issue of legacy, what his sons, his two sons are doing, what, how he came to be who he was, his relationship to his father, so on and so forth. And this is from uh, an, an, an image widely circulated from 56 up. And, and, and I make the point is that when you have diverse representations of older adults, you're challenging uh, the reproduction of stereotypes. One of the very, it doesn't mean they're not gonna, there's not gonna be a point of view. There's gonna be a point of view, but you're introducing more possibility for difference. The more diversity you can get into it. And so that's another kind of fascinating element of using the up series to, to begin the course, which is what I do now with students. And so all these people have aged differently. They, you know, different things have mattered. They're more aware of one or the other of the three aspects that I talked about. Their body had, and the, the decline of their body has been more important for some. The loss of wages and work has been more important for others in a neoliberal economy, which they're explicit about. And um, you know the the uh, access to supportive relationships is different. So there's, at one extreme, there's one character. Um, it's the one we've always wind up talking a lot about. Pretty sure it's, he's Neil, the little boy, who's just gotten to be a reckless. I mean, he actually sort of pulled himself out of it, but his story is a very interesting one about the significance of social relations across the life course, and especially in the aging process. So, we got a question in the front. Yeah, Before please. Before you leave that particular section, how do you bring into your studies the ethical questions that go along with aging? Um, such as? If you're a caregiver. Yeah. And you have, are caregiving for someone who is in the final stages of life, and they have desires that are totally opposite of what the caregiver has. You run into these ethical Boy, what a, thank you for asking that question, and it comes probably at a good moment. Um, I think all of our conversations go toward ethical issues, but this one in particular, uh, because I didn't show a movie like Away From Her, uh, but, but even that segment from Derek, I think, is a good example of how it came up. But we also read an article that 
my dental hygienist passed to me, right? Because these conversations <coughs> happen everywhere, so there I was with my mouth open. We always talk about aging because she has, she's now caring for her mother who has dementia, and she cared for her father who had dementia. And her mom's gonna approaching 100, and her dad lives into his 90s, and they live in town, and she's doing, you know, heavy lifting. And she passed me an article from the New Yorker called The Sense of an Ending, which you may or may not have read by a journalist, a young journalist named Rebecca Mead. And we read that article. And that article is specifically about Alzheimer's patients, but we try to say we need to generalize from this issue. And it introduces the idea of person-centered care. And in fact, when we watch Derek and Getting On, we're talking about the difference between medical models, or we've, we've introduced Sherwin Newland, who recently died, who wrote this book, How We Die, in 1991, won a National Book Award or some other kind of book award, who, who argued, a physician who argued against medical intervention at all costs in late life. And so we talk about it very much about um, about this issue, but we, it's, not, it's not the whole thing. Because if it were the whole thing, then we would be failing to understand the autonomy of adults as they age, um, their necessary participation for as long as possible in making or like planning decisions. Um, so, so it has a very important place in the class but it's situated within other conversations about how, you know, an 18 or a 19 or a 20 year old thinks about, you know, being 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. One of the things we, sh we start every class with a, a moment called aging in the news where anyone can throw something out that's happened in a conversation, in their experience, on TV, read in the paper. I tried to get them to read the Times every day, but that didn't really work. I'm usually the one who throws out the aging thing, but occasionally they bring something. But yesterday, the thing I threw out, it's from the New York Times, it's from the diary of a 12-year-old girl. Anybody see this? Utterly hilarious. The kid came home, and the mother had a package that had been misdelivered, and the mother says, get in the car, you know, you're going to run it to the house and deliver this package to its rightful person. And the kid goes up to the door, and the person yells at the kid and accuses the kid of being a thief. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the kid describes this as a cranky old person. How old is the cranky old person? Just take a wild guess. Forty. Yep. <laughs> Forty. And so, um, ha so, so part of the effort, and this is why I titled my piece from generation to generation is really to try to make this a broader conversation because I'm thinking about these questions from a very different position than they are. I mean, many of them are thinking about and are marginally involved in grandparental care. But um, this is like Mars for them. We are like Mars for them. Does that begin to answer your question? Yeah, I remember not trusting anybody over 30. Uh, <laughs> Me too. I think it's just, a really interesting thing to look how over time the media incorporates what's going on in life. Well, this is the issue. The issue is, I mean, this is what cultural theory is all about. Is like, is is media copying life? Is life copying media? And so instead of saying either, we're actually saying we're in the same soup together. These are people with um, access to to cultural production who are putting it out there, but they're no different than you and us. And they're, so yeah, we're all sensitive to things that are happening, but I wouldn't say it's copying. It's it's the question that you raise so well. That's the question in everybody's mind. No one has the answer, but we're inclined to answer it in certain ways, and we're trying to do the best thinking we can, especially because more and more people are saying, it's my turn next, so now I really care. I didn't used to care so much. In fact, I never <laughs> even thought about it, but now I really care. Yeah, Randall, thanks. Yeah, I was just curious um, um, how students deal with, because it's in America, I think we kept thinking about Ernst Becker's book, Denial of Death, in the, year, in the 70s, and um, having conversations with my grandmother about that, and both my father, who passed last year, but they didn't want to talk about that, uh, even though they were my grandmother was 90 at the time, 
and she says, well, you know, that's too, you know, that's too, too early to be talking. She lived to be 93, but this again yeah. kind of weighs in about American culture where we don't want to, to, to talk about the inevitable. Students are eloquent on this point, and uh, you know, young and hard. In, in the course of the documentary, actually, more than one of the course members dies, and um, it's not like Andrew Jenks, where we actually filmed the person dying in the hospital bed. But um, we follow people to the emergency room. Um, it's 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 a real up close experience, and and. And people are interviewed who die in the course of the film about who have illnesses, about how they feel about their imminence of their death. And some people say, I don't think about it, or I don't want to think about it. And so this is, a, again, a kind of goosebump <coughs> conversation that we find ourselves having. And I think having it with you know, people under the age of 25 is just incredible. And um, you know, it's, it's tomorrow. It's always tomorrow, and so, but also, I mean, there are these questions about how culture is helping us open up, open up the question. And again, as I say, there's so many more of us getting closer to the coffin that now we're saying, let's talk about it. Well, I, I'm just thinking when I, my children were young, I mean, we'd have to prepare something to build and make sure something happens to you, that they take care of there, you know, when you're sitting with the lawyer, and there's all the inevitable. Who would you want to care for your kids? Blah blah blah. I mean, you're signing off on papers of in immense uh, uh, magnitude because you're thinking about the, the, the future. Well, yeah. I know you read the New York Times, and yeah. so you'll see that in the this section boomer booming. Right. You know that every other week there's something about uh, what to do with your money how to organize it, you know. And so on the one hand, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute because we're talking about money, but I mean, I know that I think that the intensification of the conversations is going to make people more explicit and planful, if we can use that word, intergenerationally. And that's where I think it would be helpful to get so that we don't dump a lot of questions and, and unprepared for, because we have more stuff too. Well, last, last thing, you know, some of us. Yeah, sorry, one us, second. Uh, it's just, I guess, uh, uh, one of the things about aging films is I never see people look like my grandparents or my dad or, I hear or, uh, or, 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 or people, uh, especially because I grew up in the South where I saw a lot of aging uh, black people, and uh, not just simply black people, but it's just sort of, this aging process and how do you talk about mm -hmm. the divide in our culture of uh, all kinds of things about aging. So, and of course, women on average outlive men. So there are all kinds of racial and gender and, and social class and ability differences, and uh, but race is a very good one to use as an example. And um, you know, we use this as an opportunity to talk about the fact that what you're going to see visibly in representations in your segmented world is going to be white, generally wealthy, you know, and, and this is shaping your ideas in ways that are not necessarily in your own best interest. And so uh, we've actu we actually have the, the wonderful Cody Charles, who works in the Office of Multicultural Affairs, come to the class. And he does an exercise where he draws students' attention to the limitations of the meanings that are circulating in mass media. And um, you know, we can only hope for increasing equity in, in the mediated conversation. There are a couple of other questions, and I do want to make sure I get through the economy. One and then two. Uh, I'm involved in an organization that promotes advanced directives. And I'm really torn in that because I think you're pointing out that in different age groups, not, not necessarily uh, whether, whether they're uh, uh, in groups like boomers or, or you know, when they build, uh, millennials or generation or, or something. Yeah. But as you get older, your attitudes change. And that bothers me that we promote people that don't face death to make an advanced directive about what they want to do then, which they don't know anything about. Could you just say that part one more time? Yeah, that we, we're, 
in advanced directives. We're, we're asking people to make younger people right to write an advanced Here directive. You. Right. But they don't understand what they're really going to want later. What, what, what they want when they're 80 or 90. Well, I don't know about you, but I know that the lawyer that I had set me up said, you should review this every, you know, so often at the most every five years. I mean, I think that's true of so many things, of the way we allocate our time and resources that five years later we should look back and say, do I still want to be giving all I'm giving to X, Y, or Z? Or, and I don't just mean in our wills or the power we allocate. I mean just our energy as well. Yeah. Kind of a good segue. Uh, there was a story recently or within the last six months about people having, and I may have the name wrong, death parties. Have you heard about this? Where yeah. people get together and have it more like a party and you get your friends and family or people. Who, what's the name? No. <laughs> Before you die. Before you die. Oh. And, uh, I've seen one of these in a movie, oh, actually. I mean, this is this is a brand new thing that people are doing, and you know, so they have ever you know friends or family mostly come to their home, have the wine flowing and the you know, and make it like a party and sit around the table and talk about directives and talk about death in general. Like, hey, look, I'm going to die. Yes. But let's get over that part, and, and we're all going to. So let's just talk about it in a practical way, so it's not scary and it's not. And so, I mean, these are conversations you may be having for years, really, but you got to start the conversation. And at first I thought, that is so weird. And then I thought, no, I like the idea. Because I think that takes that whole stigma, like people keep saying we don't want to talk about it, but just make it a party. And these people were sitting around the table laughing, and it's like, you know, because then when the day comes, you're going to be a lot more comfortable knowing what everybody thinks. And uh, so I just thought it was an interesting idea, like I said, I don't know if I forget it's called death party, but something along those lines. Yeah, I think that's indicative of a kind of cultural shift, and I think that, you know, boomers and their kids talk a lot, and so I think it's going to affect, it's going to be a from generation to generation conversation one way or another. I mean, our college kids may not want to go to a death party, but they might know that their parents are going to one, for example, and what happened at it. Well, they'll hear parties, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah, I, I echo the, uh, the idea that you need to talk about that with, with humor. Uh, we had four kids, and we got together to eat one Sunday afternoon. I said, hey, we were going to talk, you know, we, we recently set up, a, got all our affairs in order, and, you know, we're going to die, we're going to be cremated. And they, they say, no, 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 we don't want to talk about yes. that. And then I said, and I'm going to, my ashes, they put my ashes in a $350 urn. <laughs> my youngest daughter said, $350 urn, hell, we're going to throw your ashes in a coffee can. <laughs> and from then on, we had a really fun uh, conversation about, about our, our, our Thank you plans. for that one. And that, that's a really good segue. And also, um, Besides the movies I actually show in class, now, you know, I'm a glutton for age movies, age theater, age whatever. And so there's actually a film I just watched on disc, because it can't stream, called Two Weeks with Sally Field. And it's about the last two weeks of her life, and they do cremate her, and there they're are four kids. And so it's these two weeks when they're kind of called to her deathbed, and all their relationships. And, you know, we're going to see more of these kind of representations. Yeah. yeah. Mary. And I think there are two things that are um, working together. One is how uh, families, you talk about generation to generation, how families deal with these issues. With nets within their family, so maybe this other, um, this other thing that's going on and that's cultural exposure is going to have influence on the way families uh, go through time and through generations and how they deal with death and aging. So some families are going to res are going to respond to just their own style, but some are going to be influenced by what's happening in culture and uh, you know education and movies and all of that. And the other thing is we're talking about um, uh, there's such a difference I think uh, the way people live their own lives before they get to be very old. My mother's quite elderly and frail. She's now in a long-term care facility. Her life has changed tremendously. There's so much more diversity. 
She lives with residents of all different types of people. The caregivers are all different types of people that she may never have uh, interacted with before. So there, there's that too, that you get uh, to a place in life where things really open up, you know, where you wouldn't expect them to. But in, in these kinds of living facilities, that's, that's possible. We want more representations of that and more institutions where that's actually possible because at the moment there's a lot of fear and there has been for a lot of years about whatever you do, don't send me to a nursing home. Could you hold that thought for just one sure. second? Okay, let's just get to the film. This was something that happened in the course of teaching, not the first year. The more I, I focused on the importance of, you know, and, and also the fact that cultural process happens within a specific environment, the more I wanted students and myself to understand aging in a specific economic moment, the moment that all of our kid, these kids that I teach have grown up in and that even precedes their birth. My students now are being born in 1994 and 1995. And so, so I really want to teach them about that word I mentioned earlier, which, it, which could be called neoliberalism or post-industrial global economy or whatever you want. What I want them to know is that they're living in a time of deregulation, of disinvestment in the public sphere, of, um, of, of sort of bottom line profit, not, not focused attention on the welfare of people. And that this means they're growing up at a specific time with a specific uh, environment of values and beliefs that don't have to be this way. And that I would like them, all of them, to go out and militate for a for a world in which that's a higher value. And so I, I'm not the only one who's thinking about this, especially as more people find themselves, you know, potentially at the mercy of social support systems. Let's just talk post-2008, but we don't need to go post-2008, but that's a, certainly a moment. And, you know, there are people who have written specifically about the circumstances of those older adults who working adults, let me just throw work into, into, into this picture, so important. So working adults before the age of, of social security benefits, but after the age of attractability to employers, tons and tons of New York Times and stuff going on about this, policy going on about this, basically after, what is it, three months of, of benefits, you know, having no um, support. And so this is a particular time when millions of individuals are facing very dire circumstances, and that is a factor at, at this moment in aging. And so before you go, so the meanings about the economy and the economic of a aspects of aging right now are occurring during a period <coughs> of global population aging, right? It's where the distribution of individuals within the population is, is veering toward older adults. And also, as I say, in this context of neoliberal disinvestment, um, and deregulation of the public sphere. And so just a list of some of the films that we specifically use to talk about, about dwindling resources, pre precarity, right? The fact that so many people live in precarious existences right now. And of course, they're coming, and this goes back to Randall's point about the limitation of what we actually see in mass culture, all these rich people dying and trying to figure out what to do with their money. And so there's also, all these are happening alongside, because you know a lot of us do have resources still, and we're thinking about how to advantageously distribute them beyond our death, and so on. And so some of these movies are, I'm not Rappaport, just a great movie about disinvestment that came out in 1996, it was an earlier play. Summer Hours, 2008, a French movie about a wealthy woman, um, uh, arranging for her bequest. Um, Old Partner, an amazing film about the transition from a traditional culture to an industrial culture in Korea. Um, and uh, an elderly couple sort of at the margin of that divide. My Piece of the Pie, my particular favorite, which is a French movie about um, basically leveraged buyouts and their impact on individuals and communities. And uh, there's an author whose work I use, Margaret Morgan Roth Goulet, who calls this premature superannuation. So in other words, you're like an old person. You're only 55, but you've lost everything. So you might as well be like an old person. And also detropia, I use to talk about the way that aging and uncared for uh, infrastructure, urban infrastructure, and now increasingly suburban infrastructure, that, that are allowing these 
public spaces to deteriorate is also sending messages about what we think about aging, old things, old places, old people. And 56 Up also uh, comments on economy quite a bit. So here are some of the images. Um, this is from My Piece of the Pie, one of a very popular French comedian uh, and this actor are sitting together. She's her whole community in um, Dunkirk, a factory at the shipping yards has been uh, closed down through this leverage buyout. This guy happens to be the one who did it by pushing a button, mm. putting all these thousands of people out of work, and uh, she wound up accidentally being his maid and then nanny. And so this is a moment when he's showing her what he does. It's the sort of leading toward the moment when she's going to find out that he's the person who, who destroyed her town. So, so in, in 56 Up, they use this British expression for um, being laid off. And the British expression is to be made redundant. And so we talk about that the whole semester. What does it mean to be a redundant person, right? Who's like broken frame, doesn't matter because you're as old as a tortoise, like they say in Derek. So um, this is from uh, Annette Rappaport, a great movie with cent uh, Central Park in New York as its principal setting. And as you know, in the 90s, there was a lot of, uh, uh, let's see, what was a lot of crime in New York. Gentrification was kind of just getting underway, and there was depopulation and fear <coughs> of public spaces and disinvestment in public spaces. Here's a picture with no one at the park. And most of the action takes place in the park. It's a place of danger, and the only people, the only sort of yuppies you see in the park are, are uh, on their lunch hour and they're running. So they're running through the park. And um, I've actually shown Detropia in this class. I happen to be from Detroit, so these things were, were in my eyesight from the time I was younger than my students, which is why are all these places abandoned and falling apart? I don't understand what it means to live in a world where all these places have been abandoned. And to me, those are, cu are val cultural values that relate to the way we think about older people as well as older places. And um, this is the movie I mentioned, Summer Hours, where a very wealthy woman is, de is dealing with the disposition of very valuable, valuable on the market um, goods. And I think about that in terms of private goods versus the public good. And I think this is the real struggle we're engaged in right now, my personal political view. And so what are my takeaways? I just want to throw that in, and then we'll get back to your question from the wonderful opportunity it has been to teach this class. Our, um, to be aware of the intensification of these debates around these ethical issues, which were ethical and political issues. So for example, this semester, two of my students are political science majors, and they're going to write about the debates and visual elements of the debates around Medicare and Medicaid. You know, And so um, engaging students with these debates related to aging and population aging is a real privilege. And um, being more aware of my own immersion in everyday life, in conversations, and social relationships, and looking in the mirror, and so on. Uh, viewing film, teach, and teaching students to view film is part of an interactive process that lives with them in their most intimate spaces, and um, encouraging critical engagement with the production of memes about aging. So I think that's, I've got a few acknowledgments. Um, all the people and places and institutions in the last four years that have made this possible. Um, and to the students first and last. And lastly, I have um, a list of the films that I mentioned in this presentation in their years. So, please. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Yeah. Um, in um, August uh, 2005, um, my uh, mother's girlfriend, well, she was dying of cancer, and cancer occurred there. So in August, uh, she decided to have a big party, a you know, celebration of life. She, so about 100 and some folks of, in her family and friends all showed up for this event at a country club place somewhere. Um, uh, and you know, it was just a different way of dealing with death. She thought, you know, I'm not, I will be at my own funeral, but I don't, you know, I want to say goodbye to everybody. So she and my, you know, we have film of she and my brother out there dancing on the dance floor, and everybody just hugging her and saying how much they loved her, and just, and she was a school nurse, um, a school up north of Kansas City. And uh, so it was just, it was just I, I went to the event, and 
you know, she she seemed fine. I mean, she didn't even seem sick hardly, but because she was having such a good time. So it's just again another way to deal with dying. And um, and the other thing I wanted to say is um, I'm a video producer, so in um, 2006, I spent that entire year going into people's living rooms and sitting at their kitchen table and interviewing older people, life stories. And it seemed like the one thing I kept hearing over and over is that they didn't think their life was that important. A lot of it were the World War II generation, and I think they're very humble anyway, and uh, you know, don't, don't want to talk about mm -hmm. myself. But, but then once you got them started and you start telling their story, you couldn't stop them, and they would just light up. And it was almost like the first time anyone had ever asked them about themselves. And then they'd see me light up about stories they were telling that they've long kind of forgotten about. I mean, one lady was uh, on a basketball team back in 1913 in her high school, and she didn't she didn't see anything, you know. And she had these great pictures of the, the girls and the team. Um, and she just didn't, and she was like a jock back in 13, because she had other sports that she did. She lived in Ohio at the time. And it just was, and she didn't think any of that was important. So it just seems like there's some something there where and people as they age forget what they, there, there are how they contributed a few to things this I, world. And, and that they need to be reminded to make themselves feel, feel good. And to keep contributing, not to mention. I think that that's a really important point, and and one aspect of it has to do with the difference between, you know, industrial production of visual representations of older adults and their legacies and their stories, and uh, everyday, um, uh, on the ground, people up, popular representations, and of course, with the. Uh, sh tremendous shifts in media, you know, everyone has a camera, everyone has a recording device, um, no lighting necessary, no development necessary, and so one of the things I often think about in, in, in this class, sometimes we've looked at websites and blogs and so on because uh, basically, and this goes back to Randall's question about industrial visual production of movies and documentaries, is that there are alternative sites and more voices and images are flooding the picture because of shifts in media. So in a way, even just looking at film is, is, is kind of an older person's game. <laughs> you know, there's all this different stuff coming out. Another point I would make is that In Nobody's Business by Alan Berliner, one of the many fights he's having with his father throughout the film has to do with whether his father's life is important. And his fa or whether Alan's important. So the, 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 the father thinks that what the son is doing, making documentaries, is a waste of time in the first place. And he thinks that his life is not important, that I'm just an ordinary guy, that nothing I've ever done is important. And that is a re that's a real good question about end-of-life issues. You know? And I think, again, it's a question even that the caregivers are asking. What is it that makes a person important at that point? You know? And so, um, so, so I think that's... Thank you for that contribution. Yes. Uh, the three of us are with a local organization, Community Village Lawrence. It's an attempt to bring a village concept to Lawrence, which seems to be a cultural and social movement in this country. It started in Boston 10, 12 years ago. You've heard of the yes. concept? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, and the main thrust is to help older people stay in their homes as they age, but it's a bottom-up type organization. It is something that's volunteers. It is something that will, will be self-supporting. It isn't a governmental agency. It's not a big corporation. And, and it's, you know, trying to address a lot of the issues of aging that um, make people can make a contribution to one another, and it's neighbors helping neighbors. And again, it's the effort is to help people stay in their homes, but I, I, because it is so popular in this country, there's over 100 in existence in the last 10, 12 years, and over 100 more in some stage of startup, it, it seems to be something that's addressing a lot of the needs that you've talked about. We hope so. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we hope so. Is there anybody who has had an opportunity to ask a question before I go <coughs> back to Randall? Can, can I just make a plug? Sure. 
We're having a fundraiser on Sunday, <laughs> August 27th. I have tickets. Anybody here, we would love to have you be our guest. Yes. How much are the tickets? Uh, for you. Oh, it's a donation. <laughs> <laughs> for you. No, we want, we want to get money. That's right. April. 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 Yeah. Okay. 27th this Sunday from 3 to 6 at Crown Toyota. And Bobby Douglas. Bobby Crown Douglas will be our, but I, I have tickets. And Great. Thank you. Anybody here? <laughs> Be welcome to be our guest. Thank you. Lee. First of all, Cheryl, thank you. You've done an incredible job <laughs> since we started this studio. But uh, the thing that you were talking about a while ago, which I think is going to be difficult, but maybe can be done, is the correlation between drawing the media, the younger sector, the, the middle-aged people, and then the boomers together to take advantage of this economic, uh, I think is a, a positive economic thing if we can learn how to direct it. It's kind of like Carstensen said when she was here, the boomer generation will probably save the country in the end because we're all looking for something, to, especially in our business, construction business, development business. When you're looking at the numbers, the numbers that we've got to take care of is a crook. And if we can learn how to harness that energy from the younger sector, from college and, and even younger, on up to now, I think some of the things we've discussed in here today is the, the important things of, of learning how each age level works with the other. And it's very important that we learn how to communicate better than we have in the past because I think over the last 40, 50 years, We've worked very hard segmenting everything and everyone apart. And because of the economy and because of the numbers uh, and because of limited resources, we're going to have to learn how to live together better than we have the last 60 years. Great point. And, and you know, one of the emphases and the surprises of, the class, of this class is how much culture is kind of invisibly pitched to a never named age that happens to be youthful. <laughs> and so um, so I, I think, and this is just a silly prescription, but I think that, you know, watching films or TV shows, you know, that include older adults and some of these issues with your, you know, with younger people is a great way to prime the conversations that, that need to occur more often, that I think will occur more often. I mean, I, I have the benefit of, you know, because I'm teaching this, I have conversations with my daughter. Our conversations, our planning has changed definitely yeah. over the last four years as a result of it. Phil, yeah. Okay. Phil, please. Well, I have a, a, a question embedded in a, a remark, which is uh, to echo what Lee just said. Thank you very much. Um, and I have a, we have a long relationship. You know, and you may not remember this, but I believe it was the theorizing course. And there was a text in that that we worked on, which was called Youth, Murder, and Spectacle. Wow, I don't remember that. And there was a film that was part of that text. And I can't recall the name of the film, but Dennis Hopper was one of the the lead characters. It was the Easy Rider? No, no, no. 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 Okay. Um, I, I, I can do better. Okay. But, you know, this is one of the the uh, effects of aging. Well, I, I, I resist that. Yeah. I resist that. And it, every time a kid forgets anything, I remind them that, that they've just forgotten something. It's actually not just older adults who forget things. <laughs> but what I, what I wanted to say to you is that, that it was a power, powerfully affecting exchange which illuminated the way that we, those of us at that time even, looked at youth in terms of the characteristics, many of the characteristics that we are also connected with in cultural production in looking at aging, which is oddly a different word. It's a gerund form that we use. We don't have a similar, all we have is old, as opposed to youth, which has this sort of mm -hmm. semantic reach. What we have is a gerund form that says, what we're doing here is aging. I think that's it's imperative to say, that part of the discovery is we don't really, uh, we really shouldn't draw a line of demarcation when that begins. Just as we look at youth, we don't have demarcation of what ages 
that covers. Absolutely. And so we don't know other than to say, if we're living, we're aging. And that's an operative that goes on over the whole continuum. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you for that, and this is a book. Thank you. When well, you're aging from the day you're born. Erin. Mm -hmm. Hey, Cheryl. Um, I have been touched by the list of duties that you have as a doctor and I was listening to an NPR piece a few days ago. It was actually about women in movies. Oh. And it was talking about how every time there were two female leads in a movie, they were always talking about men. Right, they were never talking. I heard that. Yeah, and it's so um, I think it's interesting because I, like five, ten years ago, every time I watched a documentary or a movie, it was about the negative parts of aging or it portrayed aging in a very negative way. And I think it's getting better. I don't think it's uh, quite there yet, but I wonder if there's almost the same type of rule that could exist for aging too, um, like there was with the gender in the NPR piece. I do think so, and I think that's the direction that something like Young at Heart is moving toward. And you know, what's really interesting is when I first started teaching this course, somewhere midway before now, I started trying to present so rosy a picture of age that I felt <laughs> in a certain moment, I'm like going overboard here because there is an end, <laughs> you know. And and I and so I had to kind of recalibrate myself to say. You know, and I, I refer often to that diagram that so many people have done about, you know, the slope of aging and the long decline and that what we're trying to aim for is a steady state and then extinction, you know, from a very active state. And so that's what I'm talking about now. And, I'm, I'm, and, I, and I think that more activity, less focus on wrinkled faces, you know, and I think we're going to see it. I do. It's a great point. Thank you. Thank you, Brenna and Dennis. I'm and sorry then, to be uh, overlooking those people who no, 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 are going no, no, around no. again. Okay. Yeah. I'm actually speaking on behalf of all for as well who's attending virtually. Ah. Yeah. Uh, I just had a microphone turned off. Hi, Bill. Type of question because he didn't recently notice that typically students have a lower level of empathy. He's gauging them around 30 percent. He's wondering if over the course of your teachings, has there been any responses during discussion? that have surprised you, one way or the other, over empathy or under empathy? So during discussions, has something stood out from one student? Well, here's the question, Bill. Is it our optimism or our pessimism that's kind of painting the picture? Because I actually feel that um, what's happening in this classroom is, it, it, it's, you know, it's like any phenomenal learning experience, is that students are seeing something they never saw before. They're thinking about something they never thought about before, and they are definitely becoming empathic. And so, you know, they're not able any more than we are to put themselves in our shoes, or in the shoes of their parents, or in the sho I mean, for multiple reasons. And so, I, I happen to feel there are a lot of limits to our reliance on empathy as a way of building alliances culturally and across generations. I think information is really important and, and with some of my students, but you know, there are moments every day where we, where we have to make a call and we are more or less uh, <coughs> concerned about, alert to, and on target with what's happening with the other. I mean, that's just, we're not humanly made to do that so well, it seems. It's a real struggle. And so I'm extremely heartened by what is going on in, in the classroom around these conversations. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, Dennis. Yeah, I, I think that certainly empathy uh, and the empathetic response will increase with the numbers of people who are experiencing either directly or indirectly uh, aging folks. And we know that that is only going to go up. The, idea that the boomer generation is the biggest one and after that we'll go back to normal small ones. It certainly isn't true for the boomers, the X and the Y generation. The boomer, this is all uh, cut and diced rather arbitrarily, but 77, boom, 77 million boomers, 72 million Xers, and 84 million millennials. So we're only going to have this, not a tsunami really, but a rising tide, it's like being in the basement and not being able to get out as the water 
comes up. And I think that um, we're going to have a much, much older society and a great deal of empathy will come out of that. I just got back from a trip to Tucson and um, I was astonished in the airport because I had never seen so many people in wheelchairs moving around and traveling. Really, I hadn't, I try to avoid airlines as much as I can and I hadn't been in an airport for about a year or so and I was astonished by it and I mean really a whole new business has been created about moving older people from one place to another to get the gates including my wife who couldn't have gone with me at all had she not been driven around by uh, someone in a wheelchair but I did notice some aggravation on the part of slightly younger people particularly a man who got up, he was probably 60, and his wife was in front of him, and there was an older gentleman, quite a bit older, who was taking a little bit more time to get out of the airplane than the rush of life would expect. And he grumbled something, why is this old person there? And his, his wife said, shut up, shut up. <laughs> so I think that we're gonna have a lot of these shut up, growling um, confrontations, not only looking at the other, the older person, I'm not it. This guy looked to me like he was right on the edge of being <laughs> old too, but he, he, he saw that as being different. And I think that as we get older and older, we're going to absolutely be involved. And you've said it in the last four years since we've worked on this, the number of articles films, discussions, has risen exponentially. It's just exploded in the last four years, and I'm so grateful that you uh, got involved in this because I think what it's done for you is kind of what it's done for me. It's kind of given me a new life, a new intellectual life that I was an architectural historian before this. Now I'm something different. And I don't see that changing. And I see that growing in my own life. And I believe that uh, just because of the numbers, the demographics, you just cannot avoid it. 77 million, 72 million, 84 million. This baby is going out of sight in terms of aging. And we're never going to have a younger society. So I think empathy will occur, but not without Wow, what's that guy doing so slow? <laughs> shut up, shut up. <laughs> don't, don't let that aging uh, concern you because just think there's going to be that much more wisdom. Mm -hmm. Sure, I certainly hope so. John, did you, really, really John and then Randall, and then we'll let everybody go. And do a tremendous my, things. My suggestions afterwards. Thank just you to, so I just have a really quick here, question yeah. on your teaching, teaching methodology. Yes. You haven't mentioned this in your uh, in your classes and your materials, but um, are you thinking uh, in the future of potentially using commercials as like a condensation of, of the message that comes out of film as another genre? Um, I thought about that this morning, actually, when I went over here, because we bring in everything. And the thing about commercials in relation to films is that everybody knows when you watch a commercial that somebody's trying to sell you something. And so you come to commercials with a little more skepticism. And the thing I like about bringing this kind of perspective to other cultural material is that people don't have that same skepticism. But, you know, in fact, that a kind of sales is also occurring. But I thought about it this morning because we always, we do pop up commercials every now and then and there are a lot of jokes, we didn't talk about technology. And just about the kind of general mockery that goes on quite frequently in the media about older adults. And so there's a lot of mockery about older adults ineptitude in relation to technology. It's another thing like forgetting. So it's the constant thing. So one of the things I do in my class is I make all the students come up and work the uh, equipment every day so that everyone's ineptitude is on display. And it's not just, <laughs> so I'm not just saying like, oh, I'm so old because I don't want to reproduce that language. And of course, I do have technological challenges and they do know how to do things I don't know how to do. Um, but there was a, a um, an ad I can't remember, fortunately, what it's an ad for, but it was an ad with all these um, women on a wall, putting up images and talking about putting up photographs on their board, on their wall. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I don't know if it's Gecko or whatever it is, yeah. but it was, again, it was playing on that technological 
retardation of older adults. And the other, um, the other thing is um, that I just want to point out that like Young at Heart just really points out the fact that we almost live on different planets in a certain way in our daily lives with, our, with, these, with younger people was there was Google on April Fool's Day um, made the map. They like made your map open to a Pokemon adventure. Okay, I've never played Pokemon. I've never lived with a young person who plays Pokemon. I had one girl who didn't play Pokemon. And so when I got to class, they were all in hysterics watching this thing, and they wanted to show it to me. And like 20 seconds into it, I was like, wait, stop everything. I don't even know who this is or what's happening or whatever. And I realized that 90% of what they're watching with me, they don't get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The actors are there, the issues right. are. It was like I need them to show me what they're watching every other class so that I can really understand what I'm misunderstanding, which is that they get what I get. They don't. Yeah. Thank you. Randall, do you want to talk afterwards and let? Oh, yeah. I was so, some uh, readings that I think uh, that get overlooked and like. Um, the autobiography of Miss Jane. Pittman. Yes, I taught that wonderful and book. And as as aging text. I taught that wonderful book, and you know, it, as I say, I mean, the limitation of streaming doubles right. the problem because you know there's already a dearth of representations of African Americans involved in the aging process. Actually, LeVar Burton's film, right. um, How About You, or Reach for Me, I forget which yeah. one it is. But I showed that to students, and LeVar Burton is the director of the film, and he cast himself as a caregiver in that movie. The caregivers are African American, and the, the, the right. clients, patients are white. It's extremely interesting. I mean, I really want to interview LeVar Burton about it. But, you know, so there's already a dearth of representations, and then when you get to streaming, where they're only going to stream what's circulating most, it eliminates more. So it is a problem, but the truth is, Netflix is going to be over in five minutes, and there are going to be other modes of streaming, and this is why distribution is part of the cultural circuit, because it's all about how much access can people get, who's controlling what's getting the streaming. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking about books and other stuff, but all the way of thinking about age. Oh, okay. I had hoped, if I could just end on one last note, a young student named Brendan Allen was in my course, Literature and the Life course, that honors class, and he's a poet. He's not graduated. And he had an experience. He actually lives in a four-generation household in Kansas. And um, he had an experience right on this street down here running where across, in front of Spencer Museum, Art Museum, there was a woman getting out of her car and her husband, and the husband fell. And he was kind of shooing away help, didn't want to be helped, but there he was on the ground. And, and Brendan, very conscious of all this because of our class, went and helped him. But he felt the complexity of this situation, of this man needing help and not wanting help. And I mean, I'm sorry the gentleman had to leave. I mean, these are the kind of ethical questions we talk about all the time. And he wound up writing, writing a brilliant poem about this. Mm -hmm. And I had actually hoped he could come today and read that poem to you. So it's funny that that came up, that the question of empathy came up because he found himself a little more able to hear something, think about something, than, than he would have been. Yeah, well, uh, people were actually age of students. I mean, if you were kind of prideful, you know, my grandmother was in a nursing home by then. She said, well, you know, I'm different than everybody here. And I said, what do you mean you're different? She said, I can feed myself. And uh, her dignity, basic dignity was just, if I can feed myself, I'm in control. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for coming.